Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Real quick guys, did I mention I'm giving away two of these, but we gotta hit 70,000 subscribers, we're almost there. These are the Ledgers Nano S and X, I'm giving them away to two lucky people on April 1st. Uh, again, we gotta hit 70,000. If you're not subscribed, subscribe now. Alright, back to the video. So take a look at Bitcoin, you know, we have seen a bit of a recovery. Uh, this is Bitcoin on the daily, and um, you know, I know it has seemed a bit tumultuous over the last few days, but every now and then, uh, it's always good to zoom out, take a look at the bigger picture. Uh, again, this is Bitcoin on the daily, and you guys can see we are making higher lows on the daily, uh, and Bitcoin now rebounding out of this, okay? Hopefully, we can get out of that, make some higher highs, okay? These are the highs, and if we can make a higher high, uh, bull run continuing. This is the assumption at least. Uh, and so Bitcoin right now trading at about 54,400, up 2.41% on the 24 hours. Uh, Ethereum's up 3.19%. Uh, Tether is back in the number three spot, pushing Binance coin back down to number four. Uh, and then we've got Cardano, Polkadot, and XRP uh, at number five, six, and seven. XRP trading right now at about 54.3.543, down 3.51%. All right, let's take a quick look at XRP here on the chart. Um, ultimately, still hanging on here okay we did see a bit of a dip after a couple of bullish days here so great movement upward for xrp over the last couple of days uh and now we are seeing a bit of a retracement of course xrp uh coming close to that 60 cent level and uh hopefully it will retrace back up to its inter-year high very very soon um you know as we've mentioned on this channel before this high this level of resistance here it's not that one it is this one up here uh, at about 75, well, this one hit 75, but ultimately 79.80 cents. That is going to be the real test for XRP. That level of resistance has been a tough one to crack, and so uh, we still got a ways to go to get up to there. Um, but we're making our way up, guys, and it is looking positive. Um, a lot of this hinges on the SEC lawsuit. This from John Deaton. Uh, this is why exchanges aren't going to relist XRP based only on the SEC's attorney's comments in court. Read below. So he is uh, not terribly optimistic. Um, thanks to Jay Hodel down here who has rotated uh, this image for reading. So basically, this is what the document says. Recently, Judge Netburn rightly identified the same ambiguity and asked the SEC whether its position in the case is that every individual in the world who is selling XRP is committing a Section 5 violation. The SEC did not dispute the premise of her question, responding ambiguously that, speaking very generally, non-parties XRP transactions would likely be exempt under Section 4. So that ultimately means you and I, retail holders, we are definitely not going to get sued uh, for selling XRP to exchanges. By invoking the Section 4 exemption, which only applies to a securities subject, uh, on Section 5, the SEC essentially confirmed that regardless of the seller or circumstances of the sale XRP in its view, per se, an investment contract and therefore a security, per se. So this directly threatens the interests of interveners whose ability to transact in XRP could be impaired even though there is nothing about their conduct. So it is still an investment contract in their eyes and therefore a security per se. Um, and this is why we're not seeing these exchanges, I'm, I'm assuming we're not seeing them uh, jump on board very quickly with relisting XRP. Of course, their lawyers still have their best interests uh, first and foremost as a priority. So um, John Deaton saying, you know, we're not going to see these exchanges relist right away just based on this. We are going to need to see more information come out. Uh, so I wanted to thank him for posting that. I also wanted to thank XRP Crypto Wolf for posting this. Ripple asked the judge to keep some of its confidential documents under seal. Um, this is an article here from you today. Ripple has asked Magistrate Judge Sarah Netburn to keep some of its documents attached to the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission's letter under seal. Andrew Cesarni, the former director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, who now represents the blockchain company, writes that they contain confidential and private information. The documents sought to be sealed reflect a private company's proprietary internal development and marketing strategies, uh, analysis, impressions and concerns on a range of sensitive topics that have never been made public to date. So uh, there is some uh, confidential information in there that obviously Ripple does not want uh, to be made public. I don't think it's anything that they're trying to hide. Um, it is likely just, um, you know, company information, trade secrets uh, that they don't want the rest of the crypto world and um, I mean the, the rest of the world essentially to know about. 
So they'd like to keep that secret. The documents sought to be sealed uh, reveal some confidential details about the processes of creating and distributing XRP, internal emails between Ripple employees, a description of the company's then contemplated business strategy and fundraising plans, as well as a discussion with an early stage investor. So, uh, you know, that's where we're at with the legal case uh, up to now. I also saw this from El Crypto King here on Twitter, Flair to decide on Cardano ADA integration tomorrow. Uh, and uh, this was from a couple of days ago now, according to the referendum launched on the main Main official Twitter account for Flare Networks, the vast majority of FLR enthusiasts are ready to see ADA added as an F asset. And they did post a poll over here on their Twitter page and uh, an overwhelming majority said 85.3% said that they would like to have Cardano be integrated into the Flare Networks. So uh, some interesting news there. Uh, also from uh, Flare Networks News, Flare's CostNet to Testnet is now live and peerable. After uh, extensive security testing, Flare is now open source. The state connector currently pulls state from XRP. Other networks will be added shortly. So more updates from the Flare networks there uh, if you guys are interested in that. I also saw this guys from Wrath of Kahneman here on Twitter. Ripple partner Cambridge Global Payments has partnered with Active Works, a B2B auto account payable company. They will use Cambridge Global for their FX expertise paying virtually any vendor in the world via a wide variety of payment methods. So this coming from marketwatch.com. The partnership will serve enterprise customers and upper mid-market. The announcement complements ActiveWorks' recent announcement uh, of its partnership with Comdata for B2B payment optimization services. ActiveWorks' B2B payment capabilities solve recurring business payment processing challenges through a powerful combination of workflow automation, software, and payment service using advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, the solution is designed to generate impactful savings and efficiencies while providing users a comprehensive view of their cash requirements. And Cambridge Global, uh, as we know, a Ripple partner. So I uh, wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman for posting that. Uh, I also saw this, guys, in VeChain News from the Cryptic Poet. VeChain just got some positive exposure on the Italian news, guys. It is coming. And before we take a look at this, I wanted to just take a look real quick at the VeChain chart. Uh, it is pumping up. This is VeChain on the hourly. We did see VeChain retrace, just like the rest of the crypto market. This is uh, VeChain on the hourly. But if you put it on the daily, you guys can see that trend. Look at that trend moving upward over the last year. Nothing but positive momentum for VeChain. It did reach an inter-year high of about 10 cents, uh, right now trading uh, just over 9 cents. So great news for VeChain holders. And um, I'm going to play you guys this clip, but I'm going to read the subtitles as it plays. Okay, I think I'm going to take it from around here because this is where uh, it starts getting interesting. So enhancing the producer's effort to guarantee quality uh, of their wines on the market, as well as providing complete and verified informations to highly demanding customers. Thanks to the technology built on the public blockchain platform VeChain Thor, global certification, certification body DNVGL operating in more than 100 countries designed a solution to convey step-by-step -step the story of a product. Uh, wine blazes the trails. Three wineries are testing the solution aim to revolutionize the certification industry. Uh, data and tested results collected in collaboration with Valitoratalia, I think that's what it's called, uh, flow into a story from the grape to the bottle uh, in a certified and immutable way that can easily be accessed through a QR code on the label. So uh, essentially, guys, I will link this clip. It is in Italian. If you guys do understand Italian, I just wanted to kind of get that information out. This was on Italian news, so I thought that was kind of cool. VeChain certainly getting exposure. Uh, and this from T-Hole Betic here, guys. Mojo Loop built on Interledger, one of three winners of the ISO 20022 and API hackathon put on by nine None other than the BIS. So we know the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, they put on a hackathon. And look who came out in the top three, Mojo Loop, uh, one for its solution for bridging the last mile, bringing cross-border payments to users in emerging market economies who rely on mobile money transfer systems. And Mojo Loop, for those of you guys who do not know, uh, Ripple and Mojo Loop Foundation creating a more financially inclusive future. Uh, these guys have had a relationship for a while now, this uh, article from more recently, but these guys have had a relationship, uh, and this is also connected to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. Uh, so we're seeing them win the BIS, Bank for International Settlements competition, this hackathon. Coming in the top three, guys, that is something to be said. And a partnership with Ripple, of course, all great news. And I don't know if you guys saw this, nine new global crypto exchanges to list the Sologenic token. So Solo, the first group of global crypto exchanges to list Sologenic's token. Solo has been announced uh, as per Bob Rass's tweet, and the exchanges are HitBTC, BitForex, Balaxi, 
see. Uh, Tokens.net, Coin Tiger, uh, Coins Bit, Pro Bit, White Bit, and System Coin. All right, these are going to be the latest exchanges uh, that are going to be listing the Sologenic token. The strategy to list Solo on other exchanges has been split into two phases. In phase one, the first step was to get Solo listed on multiple exchanges internationally so users from different countries can have access to trade Solo. Uh, the business development team is currently working towards additional onboarding uh, of a new exchange next week. The main focus in the second phase will be on major 10 top global exchanges. This is coming from Bob Rass, co-creator of Sologenic. The Sologenic team is forward thinking and has formed strategies to develop and introduce new products and services to revolutionize the trading financial markets. Currently in development for a quarter two and quarter three launch, the core team plans to release Solo cards in May, as well as the Sologenic DEX and the Sologenic securities trading platform. So uh, to that point here, uh, Bob Rass's tweet will announce the launch date of Sologenic DEX on Monday, March 29th. Built on the XRP Ledger, fully customizable trading terminal widgets, uh, professional charting tools, tools with one minute candles, uh, live order books, and fees as low as 0 0.000005 of a cent. So amazing news here, and yes, guys, it is built on the XRPL. And another one here, guys, from James Rule XRP on Twitter, posting this from AMB Crypto. Ripple XRP effect. How we test hasn't worked out so well, admits SEC Commissioner Purse. Now, we've heard Hester Purse's opinions on this. She did recently just do a talk. Uh, she was one of the speakers at the Draper Gorham Holmes Security Token Summit, and she has been critical about the Howey test. Um, so Purse has long advocated for regulators to create clearer rules that would allow crypto assets to thrive without fear of breaking the law. In the past, the commissioner has said that such lack of clarity has hindered innovation with the United States seen by many to be losing the technological race to other countries like China. So I wanted to analyze this. I wanted to kind of get a sense of of um, how far behind is the United States in comparison? I mean, we know the United States is behind, but how far behind? Uh, the commissioner also criticized the Howey test used by the Supreme Court to determine whether an asset is a security. According to her, the Howey test has had some challenges over the years when being applied to the digital currency industry. According to Purse, digital currencies are similar to securities in several ways, but also unique in many ways. Analyzing decent developments, she implied that the Howey test is not able to capture and define some instances of digital currency sales and distributions the same way it can capture what we would call security sales. And so uh, I don't know if you guys caught that interview that she did with uh, Thinking Crypto. Uh, I believe it was a couple of weeks ago now. Hester Purse has some interesting comments that she makes regarding cryptocurrencies uh, and the overall situation. Of course, she does touch on XRP in that interview. It's worth also noting that the US Security and Exchange Commission sued Ripple over an illegal securities offering in December, the outcome of which has been argued quite frequently on crypto Twitter. Of course, we hear it all the time. According to a digital currency lawyer, uh, named Stephen Pally, the scenario where Ripple would win the lawsuit and replace the Howey test with another legal identifier for crypto is delusional. So what he's saying is this Howey test is not going away anytime soon. Um, but we know Hester Peirce has been uh, advocating for this three-year safe harbor framework uh, for virtual currency tokens. So here's essentially what it would be. You have three years to develop the network so that the token is actually usable or the network is decentralized. And at that point, it's clear the securities laws don't apply. And everything that you say will be covered by the anti-fraud uh, laws under the securities laws. And with Gary Gensler, President Biden's nominee for the SEC's chairmanship coming in, the next few months are bound to be interesting, especially since he is known for having commented on whether XRP is a security in the past. Commissioner Peirce concluded by highlighting her optimism about collaboration with the incoming SEC chairman to develop the proposed plan in order to bring more transparency to the regulatory domain in the United States. So we know the U.S. is behind, but how far behind are they? And so um, I wanted to bring this up, guys, from John Deaton. The revolving door of corruption at the SEC. So Hinman uh, goes to the SEC and gratuitously declares BTC and ETH as non-securities. He collects millions of from his law firm while his law firm is heavily connected to BTC and ETH. But it doesn't stop there. Then John Deaton retweets out his own tweet from back on March 22nd, which is this, I have obtained all publicly available information that I can on Hinman. Uh, he made $15 million from his firm while at the SEC. 
Well, Hinman was at the SEC, and after he gave his BTC and ETH speech, the firm represented Canon and its IPO. Canon is the second largest Chinese manufacturer. Uh, and Axe Slinger down here also mentioning this article, guys, and this from back in 2017. Vladimir Putin and Vitalik Buterin discuss Ethereum opportunities. And again, this was from back in 2017. The president of Russia briefly met with Ethereum inventor Vitalik Buterin during an event last week. The meeting between Buterin uh, and President Vladimir Putin occurred at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, which took place between uh, the 1st and 3rd of July, or rather June, following address to the global group of chief executives. So according to the brief by the Kremlin, Mr. Buterin described the opportunities for using technologies he developed in Russia. The president supported the idea of establishing ties with possible Russian partners. So Russia, clearly a very secretive nation, uh, has been talking to Vitalik Buterin about cryptocurrency opportunities as early as 2017. Okay, this was even before the height of the bull run. This was before Bitcoin reached its former all-time high of $20,000. And we got to remember this happening years before Ripple got sued by the SEC. And now, you know, the height of uh, American technology with regards to the financial system, the company behind it in court because big banks are scared. Big banks don't want to change the way the system is working today. Let's keep going here, guys. This from El Crypto King echoing Ripple. China's central bank calls for interoperability between different CBDCs. So we know uh, China has been uh, working on their CBDC project. We know that they have plans to launch this at their uh, on a wide scale, at least at the um, at the Beijing Olympics. And so what's going on here? Mu Chang Chun, the head of the People's Bank of China's Digital Currency Research Unit, stressed the importance of interoperability between different central bank digital currencies during a seminar head by the Switzerland-based Bank for International Settlements. Inter Interoperability should be enabled between CBDC, central bank digital currency systems, of different jurisdictions and exchanges. So China going on the record and saying that, you know, our CBDC, we want to have that interoperability, obviously, because we want to be able to do business worldwide. China relies heavily on their exports and they see a need for this interoperability. And the good news here, guys, blockchain company Ripple recently published a white paper in which it aims to dissuade central banks from focusing solely on domestic use cases while urging them to develop collective protocols. So on the one hand, we have China saying we need to see interoperability. Then there's obviously the Ripple white paper uh, pushing for interoperability. RippleNet, that interoperable system, I mean, it's not the only one out there, but it is the one that the United States could and likely will use to get up to speed when it comes to financial markets once this SEC lawsuit passes. So each individual CBDC can create its own rules and policies that best suit its domestic market. However, CBDCs should also be united and guided by collective protocols that will enable them to cooperate seamlessly with other CBDCs and digital currencies. Um, so interoperability, I think, is by far one of the biggest uh, topics that a lot of countries around the world are obviously going to be interested in when it comes to, well, think about it, global trade. What is that system that is going to allow every single country, because you got to think of how complicated this gets. Every single country around the world deals with another country in one way, shape or form when it comes to trade. This is just how our global economy works. And so interoperability, quintessential for this to work. And we're seeing China now saying this as well. Uh, and they've been developing this for a while. So they are realizing the importance Meanwhile, the SEC holding back crypto innovation and essentially holding back the United States and preventing the United States from thriving in this global financial system. Uh, finally, guys, I wanted to bring up this chart that I found from the Bank for International Settlements. So here are some statistics with regards to retail CBDCs and wholesale CBDCs. So um, we've got blue, a positive stance here, and uh, the red color is a negative stance. Now we can see that back in 2016, uh, there wasn't too much talk about CBDCs and uh, most of it was negative. If you you guys can check that out here. And then as the years went on, we could see that both retail and wholesale discussion about CBDCs got more popular. But um, at the same time, it doesn't actually look like there was less negative responses as the years have gone on. Of course, this chart up to 2020 and by 2020, we can see when CBDCs were mentioned by central banks, uh, there was a lot of positive mention uh, with regards to that. And 
a lot of negative mention as well. So this is how this chart breaks down. Search for the keyword CBDC, digital currency, and digital money. The classification is based on the author's judgment. The score takes a value of negative one if the speech stance was clearly negative or in the case that it was explicitly stated that there was no specific plan at present to issue digital currencies. Uh, it takes a value of plus one if the speech stance was clearly positive uh, or a pilot or a project was launched uh, or was in the pipeline. Other speeches were not displayed here. So we've got the positive uh, views on CBDC, negative views. And I find it interesting. You would think that the negative views would go down over time, but uh, they have also been as prominent as the positive views. I guess the only change really is that more discussions of CBDCs has been occurring over the last several years. Now let's take a look at this chart over here, motivations for issuing a general purpose retail CBDC. So payment safety robustness, very high in both these categories, payment efficiency for domestic, uh, quite high as well, financial stability, quite high, uh, monetary policy implementation, you can see the statistics there, uh, payment efficiency cross border and financial inclusion quite low for the AEs, but uh, still relatively high for the EMEs. Now, I guess I should mention this in case you don't know what the acronyms are. Uh, AEs are advanced economies and the EMEs are emerging economies. So you can see why advanced economies uh, wouldn't uh, necessarily put financial inclusion as a priority there. Uh, but here are the statistics, guys, motivations for using a general purpose retail CBDC. Payment efficiency down here, uh, clearly not as high as one would think. And so this takes into account numbers of countries from all around the world. Of course, there are countries where uh, payment efficiency is definitely a very big issue, like in emerging economies, but even in advanced economies, uh, they're not prioritizing it as much. And I have a feeling that this is likely possibly the reason why Ripple is still in court with the SEC. The banking system works in the eyes of the old world. There is no need for innovation uh, in their view. And so we're gonna drag this out there thinking, but they don't see the repercussions. I mean, at the moment, there are no repercussions because we're still essentially working in that old system. But I have a feeling coming out of this pandemic, lots of things are gonna change. And there's no doubt that Ripple is going to come out of this lawsuit and um, likely have to pay some fines here or there. I don't think XRP is going to be classified as security. I think they are going to get back on track, continue with the progress they've been making. I guess the question then will be, will they be able to catch up with all these new technologies that are occurring in countries like Russia, like China? Does the United States still stand a chance? I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel. Guys, we're almost at 70,000 subscribers and we're about a week away. I'm giving away two Ledger Nanos, but you gotta subscribe to have a chance to win. Subscribe now and like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.